I'm going to uh, frame my talk on uh, digital, uh, on privacy in the digital age around two specific questions about whether or not privacy is dead. Uh, we hear this all the time these days. Is privacy dead? And the other question is whether or not the millennials care about privacy. So I think before I get into the two relevant Supreme Court cases I would like to talk about, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how the how we, how we see privacy and how we understand what it is. Uh, Justice Louis Brandeis was, was famous for saying that privacy is a right that could be summed up in six words. The right to be let alone. That can mean a lot of different things. It has a lot of different permutations. Uh, I would say that one of the most important ways of, of thinking about this is what you want it, what, what extent the, the government should have intrusion into your life. Uh, this, is a, this is the most obvious form of, of privacy right that we know. It's a, a Fourth Amendment uh, unreasonable search and seizure right that, that we uh, think about. And so this is, this is one way I'll be talking about it. And another way I'll be talking about it is, is under what we know as substantive due process, which has a, a much wider application uh, in, in terms of privacy, and it's, it's based on the Supreme Court case Griswold versus Connecticut from 1965. So, uh, but addressing the other side of this, is it relevant? Obviously, I would say it is. Uh, do the millennials care about it? I would say obviously they do care about it. The millennials get a bad rap for being tagged as shallow and narcissistic. You know what? Anybody can be shallow and narcissistic. It doesn't matter what generation you belong to. So I would say that the millennials are unfairly targeted for this uh, because I think they really do care about privacy. In fact, I think they care about privacy in a way the rest of us could actually find as inspirational. So let's, let's talk about uh, 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 these two different types of privacy that I mentioned uh, and, and look at some statistics about how this, how this uh, uh, plays out. So, in terms of the, the, the Fourth Amendment privacy of uh, uh, unwarranted intrusion into your life by the government uh, in a very specific way, uh, the, the protection against unwarranted uh, searches and seizures, the millennials are actually the most critical of, of government intrusion into our lives. The millennials are the people who remind us that the government does need to stay out of, of, of aspects of our lives in terms of it, combating terrorism. This 55% this, uh, of millennials, when polled, and they are the only group that had a majority in saying this, is that the government has gone too far in snooping on Americans uh, to, to uh, monitor for potential terrorist threats. We all want the government to do whatever it can to protect us from terrorism, but there are limits in how far the government should be able to go. And the millennials are really kind of on this. They're the only ones who will say, as a majority, no, the government can't, can't go too far. So 55% of millennials are extremely critical of how far the government has gone this so far. Now, another interesting uh, statistic that we see is some, uh, the popularity ratings of Edward Snowden largely seen in the press and the American government as a traitor, uh, somebody who went too far in, in uh, exposing government data. But the millennials in, in the United States have a 56% approval rating for Edward Snowden. So the millennials see Snowden in a way that many other people in our country do not. Now, when you look at the other side of it, that's the sort of Fourth Amendment side of it, let's look at the substantive due process side of it, rights that, that, that are long protected in, in, under the, the, uh, the guise of privacy would be sort of like uh, anything having to do with your body, your mind, your free thought, that, that has a, a certain kind of privacy angle too. So if you look at where the millennials are on abortion, 56% uh, of Millennials say that abortion is justified for nearly any reason. So millennials uh, tend to have a very high level of respect for that sort of personal privacy surrounding the body. Uh, and another way that this gets extended is with marriage rights. Uh, the millennials, when polled, are also the uh, most supportive of same-sex marriage. I know that's a lot of statistics up there, but what's, what's key here is that the millennials are 73% in favor of protecting privacy rights for same-sex marriage. So 
the millennials get a very, very bad rap for being shallow. But it's, it's, it's undeserved. So let's, let's look at some of these privacy rights. I want to look a little uh, deeper at this. So let's talk about two uh, recent Supreme Court cases that sort of frame these debates we're having about uh, various forms of privacy. So there's a Supreme Court case from 2014 called Riley versus California. Riley versus California uh, sort of concerns this what to do about smartphones. So a, a smartphone, as we all know these days, uh, is not like any other kind of phone that you might have. Uh, you, you can, it, they're quantitatively and qualitatively different. Quantitatively, uh, they can hold a lot of data. Uh, you know, they, they, you could watch movies on them now. So there's a lot of data, there's a lot of storage potential in a, in a smartphone. Qualitatively, they're different because they hold wide, a wide range of information. It's not just that they can hold a lot of information, they can hold a wide range of information. People can do their banking from their phones. People, as I said, they can watch movies, they can communicate with other people, listen to music. There's a lot of, a wide variety of things. So in this Riley versus California case uh, that goes to the Supreme Court, it's the question is whether or not the, the police, if, if you have been arrested for some other purpose, if the police can have access to that data. And it turns out, according to the Supreme Court, uh, and a very strong majority in this case, that you, if you are a police officer, you have to get a warrant before accessing the data in a smartphone. Uh, you can't simply, uh, if, you, if you've pulled someone over for, for some other thing and you're going through looking for uh, uh, various uh, other potentially problematic or illegal things, if you find a smartphone, you can't open it. And this is a place where I think, uh, the millennials understand something that, that maybe the rest of us don't, that, that these kinds of things uh, need to be protected and are very important. But then if you go to the uh, substantive due process side of this, this argument and you look at a case like Obergefell versus Hodges from 2015, this, this is a different kind of privacy, like this is the same-sex marriage case that we all have heard about. So this particular case is focused on the right of privacy to make decisions for yourself in your own life without government intrusion. That's what's at the root. And I don't think, I think this kind of got lost in the same-sex marriage debates, that people were, were, were focusing on a lot of the wrong things. This isn't whether you approve of it or don't approve of it. What it, it's about is whether or not you have the right to make that kind of decision for yourself, and whether or not someone else has the right to make that decision for you. So this is how it works, and it's, and it's based, as I said earlier, on the, the 1965 Supreme Court case Griswold versus Connecticut, where Justice Douglas, who wrote the majority opinion in that case, identified three zones of privacy that, that were protected by um, uh, various clusters of, of amendments in the Bill of Rights. So you have one zone which, is, uh, which protects your um, right to your association with other people. That comes from the First Amendment. Um, your, that's freedom of religion, freedom of press, freedom of speech. Uh, the thing that, that all those, those rights have in common is, is your associational rights, your right to, to be with other people of, of your choosing, and it's not up to the government. So, so that's one zone of privacy. A second zone of privacy is your home and your private property. That's that Fourth Amendment thing I talked about earlier. Uh, that is, you have a right to, to see your home space as a place where you have a, a, a additional privacy rights that you may not have in a public space, but you would have them because it's your own private space. And the third uh, area is, is sort of your mind and body, your, 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 the, your integrity, your... Uh, your right to make certain kinds of decisions for yourself that other people wouldn't really have the right. Whether they approve of them or not is, irre is irrelevant. It's about how you experience your life. So this is kind of what Obergefell's decision is based on. Whether or not two people of whatever gender have the right to make this kind of decision for themselves. And as it turns out, according to the Supreme Court, yes, you absolutely do have that right. So. This is kind of what's, what's at stake with, with privacy rights. Uh, and, and the Obergefell case is, is probably going to go down as one of those cases that 
you know, we're, we're, it's controversial now, but probably won't be. Loving versus Virginia is, is, is a case on which it is based, uh, the, the famous 1967 case about interracial marriage, which had the same, really, if you read the Obergefell case next to the Loving case, they say almost the same thing. Um, it's it's a, a intimate decision. The right of personal choice is very much a privacy right. So bringing it back to the millennials, I think that where we are in, in popular culture, you see people uh, so dismissive of the millennials and, and they're so shallow because they're posting everything to social media all the time. Um, first of all, just because you post a lot to social media does not mean that you are shallow. Uh, and, and, and second of all, um, maybe there's something that those of us who are not millennials have missed about the millennials because I teach them and I interact with millennials on a daily basis, uh, I think I have learned some things from them that, that, that I'm grateful to have learned. That, uh, you know, uh, it, it, what you see as uh, them just kind of disgorging every piece of their lives into the public sphere is not how they see it. Uh, they see the pr profiles as, as a kind of managed space. They're not they're not necessarily telling you anything that they don't want you to know. Um, I mean, okay, we all know people who do that. But, 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 but you know, maybe you're one of those people, but, you know, pull back. But, but, but yeah, it's just a little bit. But, but, but the point is with the millennials, I think they have the best sort of framing for this because they don't necessarily, they're not going to tell you anything that they don't want you to know. So, I think that is, if you start from there, that they see this as nothing more than a way of, okay, I have to have a page so I can connect with other people. Uh, and, and you just understand that that's how they understand it. Um, then you can kind of see, well, okay, does that mean they don't care about privacy rights? That's what people say about them. Because they are so willing to put things out there in, in social media, that, that, that is assumed that they don't care about privacy as such. And I have found that that is, that is not the case with millennials. That, that in fact, they care more about privacy, I think, than a lot of other people do. Uh, because they, they understand 